Hello and welcome to ITU Presents. I want to let you know that we are very honored to have with us an executive who has been in the theatrical business for well over 30 years, Mimi Intagliata, who is the Director of Production Operations at Disney Theatrical Group, is here with us. Uh, it is not often that you're able to have access to somebody like Mimi. So we appreciate that you have come on today. Thank you so much for joining us. And please let us know what you'd like us to know today. Great, thank you, Jake. I am so pleased to be here with all of you. Um, it's such an honor to speak to uh, such a, a, a nice group of people who, who uh, do things that I can't even conceive of doing. Uh, technology, computers, uh, you know, it's it's not my special my speciality. So uh, it's great to be coming into your world and hope that I can bring my world to you a little bit. So um, as Jake said, I'm currently working as the director of production operations at Disney Theatrical Group. Disney Theatrical Group does all of the Broadway shows, uh, Disney Broadway shows. You've probably heard of uh, Aladdin, The Lion King, recently Frozen, um, also uh, Beauty and the Beast. So uh, we do all the Broadway shows. We do the touring shows that travel across the country of those same shows. And then we do these shows all over the world. We either self-produce or do them uh, with our partners, uh, our producing partners all over the world. So uh, that's essentially uh, what we do at Disney Theatrical. And I am part of the team that brings the shows from, as I like to say, from the page to the stage. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. So, um, all right, moving on. Okay, so uh, my background is in theater. I've been doing theater essentially my entire career. Uh, I, I was really, uh, as a kid, I did a lot of performing just, you know, in high school, uh, musical theater. And I went, to, I went to college at Indiana University in Bloomington uh, a very long time ago. Um, for, uh, for theater. And my goal was to become an actor. Um, and essentially, I, what I realized was uh, that unfortunately, I was uh, less talented than my peers. Um, and I also didn't have the tenacity to be an actor. Um, acting takes a lot of tenacity and a lot of dealing with rejection. And that was not something that I was particularly good at. Um, so it really wasn't at the end of the day for me, acting. Um, but fortunately, I was more organized than my peers and some of my professors and one of, an older student who was a friend of mine kind of recognized that and they said, you know, you should really be a stage manager. And so um, I started out as a stage manager uh, and then I ended up over the course of my career being um, a, a prop person and a lighting technician and then eventually a production manager, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, but I have experienced in children's theater, dinner theater, regional theater, touring theater, and Broadway. I've been, I've done a lot of different things, uh, which is, in my opinion, the mark of somebody who's had a good run in the industry is doing lots of different things uh, in theater because that's a, that's a way to kind of build your skill set. So how did I get here? Uh, as I said, when I was in college, um, it became evident it kind of early on that uh, I was probably not going to be an actor. Uh, so I started stage managing. And essentially, for those of you um, who don't know what stage managing is, basically a stage manager um, helps the director kind of and choreographer kind of run the show, run rehearsals, make sure that the actors are where they're supposed to be at the right time, make sure the rehearsal room is run properly. Uh, they usually have a team of a couple of people. Um, who work with them. There's usually kind of a head stage manager or a production stage manager and then a couple of assistants. And uh, they make sure that uh, the rehearsal runs well. They take down all of the blocking, which is, you know, where the actors walk and move at any given time in the show. They support the choreographer. Um, they, they kind of run the room in rehearsals and they keep track of everything, where the props go, um, you know, who's on stage when, who has entrances and exits, what side of the stage they're coming in and out of. So the stage manager really is responsible for helping the director get the show up on its feet. Uh, and that's in the rehearsal studio. And then when, when the show moves into the theater, um, the stage manager runs technical rehearsals. So the stage manager calls all of the cues 
Um, and when we say cues, we mean, you know, lighting cues, when the lights change, when scenery moves on stage, uh, when audio sound cues happen, the stage manager is the person that is the production stage manager is calling all of those cues. And then they usually have a couple of assistant stage managers who run either side of the stage, who make sure, you know, that the actors are safe, that the, the scenery is moving the way it's supposed to. Uh, they really are the ones who make sure that the show functions on a nightly basis once they get into the theater. So that's what a stage manager does. And I really enjoyed that. I, I had a great time stage managing. I stage managed for over 10 years. Um, I stage managed um, on tours. I stage managed, as I said, you know, I started out, my first professional job was, was uh, stage managing uh, in a children's, for a children's touring theater. And that was me and four actors in a van with all of the set and the props and the costumes in the back of the van driving to elementary schools, you know, sometimes two a day. And we'd spend an hour setting up the, setting up the show and then we'd do an hour long show and then we'd break the show down and we'd put the show back in the van and we'd drive to the next school. So that's, you know, that's how I started out. Um, and then I worked at a dinner theater. You probably don't, some of you might not even know what dinner theater is. Dinner theater is where you actually come into a building and you eat dinner. They have a buffet and you have dinner and then you watch a show and then you have dessert at intermission and then you watch the second half of the show. There's not a lot of those around anymore, but, um, but it was a great experience. Um, at the dinner theater, I was not only the stage manager, but I was the, I was the lighting person. I was the prop person. I was the carpenter. Occasionally, I was the costume person, um, even though I can't sew. Uh, so that was a great experience. You know, I had to do a lot of different things uh, and that happens a lot in theater because there's a lot, there's a lot of theaters that don't have a lot of money. And so, uh, we are often called upon to do lots of different things and fill lots of different roles. So, um, interestingly at the dinner theater, uh, I found out that the, the people who owned the th dinner theater also had a, had a touring company. And so I got hooked up with this touring company. Uh, and we toured shows all across the country, and uh, I did what was called bus and truck tours, and that li means that literally we traveled the show uh, in trucks. Most tours, and I'll talk about this in, in a little bit later, but most tours travel shows in, a, in trucks, but the type of tours I was doing, there were very small shows, so there were only two or three trucks maybe, and then the crew who were was like the, me, the stage manager and the carpenter, the lighting, per, lighting person, prop people. We all traveled on a rock and roll bus. So a bus with bunks in it. We would sleep on the bus overnight and drive. A professional driver would drive us from city to city. And we would play literally one night, one night tour, one night shows. So you, we'd roll in in the morning at like eight o'clock in the morning. We'd load the show in, we'd put the show up and the cast would roll in later that afternoon and we'd do a sound check, talk about how the show was going to go that day. We'd do the show and then we'd take it all down, put it back in the trucks and off we would go. So that was quite an experience. Um, literally playing one night at a time, doing a show every, almost every single night in a different city. Um, so that was quite, uh, quite a, a difficult experience. But when I, when I woke up uh, on a bus at about age 30, uh, and I hadn't had a shower in a couple of days, I said, you know, I think it might be time to move on. So uh, I, I got into production managing. And basically production managing in theater is kind of the next level up from stage managing. So the production manager uh, on, a, on a show um, will essentially write, help uh, formulate the budget for a show and work with the, the director and the creative team, the designers, uh, to do all of the logistics necessary, technical and logistical scheduling, budgeting to get the show on the stage. So the production manager is really kind of, if you, you know, the, the center of the wheel with all the spokes going out to the, you know, to the rest of the wheel, the production manager makes sure that the set gets built on time and on budget. Um, same for the costumes, works with the lighting designer to make sure the lighting package is, is rented and, and loaded in, uh, the sound package. So um, the production manager is really um, central to getting the show, again, from the page to the stage. And the production manager works with the stage manager as well and coordinates with the stage manager who is handling you know, things on the stage on an, a moment-to-moment -moment basis and, and running the show. 
So uh, I moved into production managing and I was a production manager uh, for, the, for this touring company. And um, then eventually I got hired um, by a, a Broadway producer, um, the Dodgers who, who produce um, a show called Jersey Boys you might've heard of. Uh, they didn't produce that when I was there. Um, I did get to work on 42nd Street and You're in Town and a couple of other shows that didn't work out so well. Um, but uh, so I was a production manager within their general managing um, office. And general managers um, kind of are the, the other half uh, of the kind of the flip side of the production manager. So the general managers ha handle all the business aspects of theater. So general managers hire people, do payroll, pay people, and um, work deals. They take care of the deals with, uh, with the designers and the creatives. They, uh, they write um, the larger budget. The production manager will, will do the physical production budget, but the general manager will do the salaries and put together uh, the bigger, but the larger budget. Uh, so the general manager is kind of the business aspect of things and the production manager is kind of the technical and production aspect of things. So the production manager and general manager work very closely together. So I was the production manager within kind of a general managing office general managing and producing office. So that's who, that was the next step for me is I, I went and worked there for several years and got to work on uh, several Broadway shows and tours. Um, so after that job, uh, I, I kind of floated around a bit and then I landed at a regional theater um, in New Jersey called Paper Mill Playhouse. And uh, I was the uh, production manager and later director of production there. And in a regional theater setting, a production manager you know, is again, pretty much what I described, you know, making sure that the scenery gets built, we bid it out to various shops to make sure we were getting a good deal um, on the scenery, getting the best deal we could, uh, getting it built on time and on budget. And uh, again, supporting the design and creative team to get their vision onto the stage. So I was with Paper Mill for about uh, seven years and we did a show that some of you might've heard of called Newsies um, which is a Broadway musical. It wasn't a Broadway musical, I shouldn't say that. It was Newsies the musical. And that was uh, Disney. It was a partnership with Disney. And so we put that, we premiered that at Paper Mill Playhouse and I got to work on that. And I, I got to know um, the folks at Disney Theatrical. And I got a call about a year and a half after we did Newsies. And they said, um, you know, would you like to come work for us? And I said, yeah, work for Disney, do Broadway again. For sure. So that's how I, that's how I landed at Disney. So that is how I got to where I am. And I, I do want I, I want to tell you all kind of the trajectory of my career because I think I'm going to explain a little bit more like what kind of theater, um, various what kind of theater uh, there is in the industry. And um, I think it's uh, it's interesting that I've actually worked my way through a lot of those <laughs> types of theaters. Uh, over the course of my of my career. So going back to our um, slideshow. So um, now you know kind of how I got here. So I might have used some terms uh, as I was talking about all that that could be a little bit confusing. So let's talk for a minute about exactly what is when I, you know the theater industry. What is that industry? So what most people know about theater is Broadway. That's obviously the biggest, most obvious type of theater. Now, Broadway is super specific. Broadway only exists in New York City and it only exists within like a 10 block <laughs> area. So there are about 40 Broadway theaters, I think it's 41 to be exact. And they basically exist between about 40th Street and about 50th Street um, in Times Square in New York City. And not anybody can just decide that they're a Broadway theater. You, you kind of have to be, um, you have to meet certain criteria. You ha have to be over 500 seats. You have to be in that area. And you have to be, generally speaking, a commercial endeavor. And you're going to be, you have to be in those particular theaters. And there are certain theaters that are designated as Broadway theaters. Um, so Broadway is essentially a commercial enterprise. It's a money-making profit enterprise. Um, and Broadway theater is produced by um, commercial producers who get together 
a group of investors who are interested in their show and invest in their show. Uh, Broadway is presented and produced um, via limited liability companies, which is may not sound terribly interesting, but I find it very interesting because what that means is that you have to show, to be an investor in a Broadway show, you have to prove that you're not using that money to feed your family, to pay your mortgage. Um, you have to show that the, it's dispensable funds because Broadway is a notoriously unsuccessful business. What people like to say about Broadway is you can make a killing, but you can't make a living. So approximately three quarters, somewhere between 75 to 80% of Broadway shows are actually financial failures. So they never make back the initial investment in the show. So if a, a Broadway show costs, let's say $15 million to produce, many Broadway shows never even make that back. So um, I find that interesting uh, that you have to really be somebody with a lot of money in order to invest in a Broadway show because it's such a dicey proposition that they don't want people losing their homes and not being able to feed their families. So it's a commercial proposition. People invest money and they try to make their money back. So that's Broadway. Uh, there are a couple of not-for-profit theaters that, that qualify as Broadway theaters, but generally speaking, it's a commercial enterprise where people try to make money. There's also off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway and off-off-off-Broadway and off-off-off-off-off-off-Broadway. Um, most off-Broadway, much of off-Broadway is not-for-profit. Um, off-Broadway theaters, um, you know, famous theaters like Second Stage and the Atlantic Theater Company, uh, they are not for profits because it's very difficult, as I've just stated, to make to make money um, in theater to actually make a profit. So off Broadway theaters are theaters in New York City that are smaller, usually 499 seats or less, um, and they um, could be anywhere from you know down in the Village to somewhere on the West Side to on the Upper East Side. They're all over Manhattan and Brooklyn, Queens. Uh, they're generally smaller theaters. As I say, there's sometimes theater companies, though there are theaters that you can rent and put a show up. So sometimes they're commercial enterprises. Often they're not for profits. Um, and it's a, where a lot of people get their start before they come to Broadway. And there can be very, very good, excellent shows that are done. Um, the Public Theater is an example. Most people know the public where Hamilton started. Um, that's a not for profit off Broadway theater. Touring. Uh, I mentioned touring. Uh, I did touring myself. I also worked on the tour of Newsies, uh, the musical. Touring is essentially an arm of Broadway. So shows that start on Broadway usually go on tour. And that's just a way of making more money. So Hamilton, for example, show that many of you may know on Broadway, it's now, uh, it's been pre-pandemic, it was out on tour. So they basically take the show, they modify it so that it can travel. So we put the shows into, as I said, tractor trailers um, and we travel them across the country. Um, a show, like I was saying, the small shows that I worked on, two or three trucks. Um, Newsies, the tour that we, of Newsies, which was actually a smaller show in comparison to our other shows, was nine trucks. Um, Lion King is, I think, right currently around 18 trucks back in the day when phantom of the big phantom of the opera was was traveling across the country i believe that was in about 30 trucks so the tours can really vary in size um but they then they can also vary as to how long they stay in a place and that depends on their popularity so hamilton is sitting down for months in cities right now because it's very very popular the lion king for years sat down for you know very long periods of time now we're playing more like two to four week um, stretches newsies played about a week in every city although we did longer and then i did one nighter tours so there are all these levels of touring um, but it is a, 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 again a commercial enterprise it's for money making that's the point um, and it can be very lucrative Generally speaking, tours um, end up making money. They don't tend to close um, because usually you can kind of figure out how, what your economic position is going to be for that tour. Um, so it occasionally it happens that they close, but usually the tours, tours will have a run of, you know, a couple of years, maybe longer. Lion King has been touring for over 20 years. Um, so it's obviously one of the most successful pieces of theater ever produced. 
and it's been out there for a really long time. Then there's regional theater. I mentioned that I worked at Paper Mill Playhouse. That's a regional theater. Um, these are theaters all over the country, large and small. Basically, regional theater is a catch-all phrase for, um, for theaters that exist in assorted places that are as as uh, ascribed to an equity contract called the LORT contract, which is the League of Resident Theaters. They, um, LORT is it just, a, as I said, it's just an equity contract, so it's just a way of referring to this group of theaters, but they can be very large. So LORT, LORT A, they can be down to LORT E, which is a very small um, theater. So there are various, various levels of theaters, but regional theaters are generally speaking not-for-profit. So again, they have a not-for-profit status. They have a tax, you know, tax incentive. Um, nobody's getting rich usually. Uh, and they have what we call both earned and unearned income. Earned income being ticket sales, unearned income being donations, grants from the government, grants from, from foundations, so regional theater is usually not for profit and it is in the regions. So we're not talking about primarily New York, we're talking about, you know, Chicago, St. Louis. I mean, there are road, there are touring road houses in most major cities as well. Um, but these regional theaters are resident theaters. They have a staff, they stay there, you know, they're located in a city and they produce theater, um, you know, year round or on a particular schedule. So that's, that's regional theaters. And that's kind of the other really big piece of theater that exists um, in the industry. And then there's all the rest. Community theater, educational theater, summer stock, rep. It's, you know, there's just all kinds of theater that, that goes on in the country. Most of the rest um, is again, not for profit, um, but there are some small commercial theaters. The dinner theater that I worked at, for example, back in the day, that was a, uh, that was a for-profit enterprise. Um, but there is, um, there are a lot of community theaters. I, we have like three in my, in my small town here in New Jersey. So um, all kinds of other theater that goes on, you know, kids putting on a show in the barn, whatever, lots of, lots of other types of theater uh, as well. All right. So when we talk about um, theater technology, and I'm just going to jump into that because you all are, um, you all are technological people. Um, Technology is really important in theater. And that is something that's basically started um, happening in the last, probably I'm gonna say since kind of the middle of the 20th century. I think that um, most people don't often think about theater as a technological um, piece of entertainment. And I think that's because we, Theater is such a human form of uh, a human art form that we don't really we don't really think about it as technical in the way that we do film, um, and so it's hard for us, I think, to really grasp how important technology is in theater. But it's extremely extremely important, um, and it's become important, as I say, over the course of the last you know probably about seventy five years. Um, so this falls into various categories, scenery and props, and lighting, audio, and projections. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about each of these, but I just want to sort of say that like really prior to the middle of the 20th century, you know, most of theater technology was very basic. It's an old business. I mean, it's probably the oldest form of art and culture in, in the world. I mean, the Greeks were doing this way back when. Um, so it's been around a very, very long time. And um, most of the technology and, and the way that they managed the shows uh, was done through, you know, ambience means and architectural means. So they had the Greek theaters that were outside, you know, lit by the sun. Um, going to the old globe back in England where they had, you know, candles back to the 18th, 19th century where they had gas lights, you know, this incredible explosion of technology, like much other technology though, has really over only happened over the last 75 years. And the rate of change in the theater industry, like in all other industries where it comes to technology has been really incredible. 
Um, and interestingly, I think I've seen a lot of that change over the course of my career, really in the last 30 years. Um, so uh, that rate of change has been incredible as well. So when we talk about scenic fabric, scenery, technology and scenery, we're talking about kind of a couple of key, key things. We're talking about the fabrication of the scenery. We're talking about the running of the shows and we're talking, uh, and also then prop fabrication. So scenic fabrication, CNC routers, water jet machines, all of these things are highly technical, run by computers and can do incredible things. CNC routers, you can give them a pattern and they can cut a scenic piece. They can route a scenic piece uh, and it's all done with computers, all pre-programmed and all robotic. It's amazing. Water jet, same thing. Um, so it's a high pressure water jet that can cut all kinds of materials. Uh, winch motors and chain motors are used to, to run the show, the, to move the scenery within the show as our hydraulic lifts. Uh, automation consoles, those are what control those, those pieces of technology. Um, and certainly in prop fabrication, 3D printing has been huge. So I want to just talk a little more about technology on the scenic side. Um, you know, motors have changed in, back in the day prior to automation. Um, you had to have human beings move scenery. So, you know, that you needed like 10 people backstage to, to move, <laughs> move the scenery. Uh, and now we can move it effortlessly with the touch of a button. So that's had an effect not only on, you know, the backs, the way the backstage runs, and, you know, the types of scenery we can build. It's also had somewhat of an effect on how shows are, are written, how they're presented. Um, we used to do uh, something that was called an in one scene. So on stage, we have wings and we call them in one, in two, in three. These are the wings that are separated by, um, by soft goods um, so that we have different playing spaces, different planes where we can play closer to the audience, farther away from the audience. So prior to automation, you know, you would have to bring the actors downstage close to the audience and bring in like a curtain or a drop. And then you'd have to change the, the scenery behind that curtain or behind that drop because that's what it took. It took people doing that. Well, now we can automate a lot of that. Uh, and so we don't have to have those weird scenes where we bring everyone downstage and we bring in something to hide everything. So now you see a lot more cinematic movement in theater. You see things move from scene to scene more seamlessly because we can automate things and move things on and off stage so much more easily. Um, and we have an automation console that moves everything and we, you know, we time everything and uh, it can all be coordinated. Um, so that's all done. That's usually done with winch motors um, or hydraulic lifts where we go, we have lifts under the stage that can lift people up to stage level. Um, and then we have now we have chain motor chain motors, um, you know, are up in the they're the rigging that hold they they can hold up lighting truss and other types of scenery. Um, but now we have winch motors that are variable speed that can talk to the automation console, giving us more options for that. So when you go to see a show, especially a Broadway show or a show at a large regional theater, um, chances are that you are seeing lots of things being moved with computers and being moved with technology and not as many things being moved um, with human beings. So that's been um, hugely important. Um, and the, the technology of that is hugely important to the way that we, the way that we um, tell stories in the theater. <clears throat> Uh, in addition to scenery and props, oh, and props, I'm sorry, I should just say that obviously 3D printing, when it comes to props, you know, 3D printing is just mind blowing. Uh, the fact that we can have a, a designer draw something up and turn it into a 3D file and then have it printed and have it printed in the right color with all the right specs is amazing. Um, so that's been a huge leap for uh, prop fabrication. Uh, still, a lot of things are done by hand. It's it's a highly artisanal um, uh, piece of, of our industry, but the 3D printer is changing. It has changed it and is going to continue as 3D printing evolves. It is going to hugely change prop fabrication and, and scenic fabrication as well. Um, so that's a big piece of technology for us, I think, now and in the future. 
uh, lighting. Um, so in lighting, we are basically talking about um, moving lights and and the uh, control consoles for the moving lights and, and the other lights, and then also LED technology. So moving lights are a relatively um, new um, technology for us. Uh, they really came into use um, starting in about the late eight, 1980s, early 1990s. I myself actually worked with some of the first moving lights, which weren't actually moving lights. It was actually a static light um, that had a mirror in it and the mirror moved and you would focus it with the mirror. And those things, I had to focus it every single night because it wouldn't hold the focus. Um, so those were early moving lights. Uh, prior to that, we had just static lights. So, you know, just various types of, of static lights. And the downside of that was you had to have, anytime you wanted what we call a special. So you, you wanted like this one pool of light right here that an actor was gonna stand in. So if you had too many of those, you had to, that's the only thing that light could do was that particular special. So you might have to have a lot of lights for those specials and you were limited to what you could do with static lights. So moving lights have changed that completely because now you have one light that can, can be a special here, over there, back there. And so it's helped us um, to reduce the number of, of lighting units we have. I mean, I mean, I say that, but lighting designers still put a lot of lighting units in shows, but we don't have to have all these different specials. We can have one light can serve a lot of different purposes. They also can automatically change color. They have various patterns. They can have a hard focus, a soft focus. So they're incredibly flexible lighting instruments. So lighting designers just have so much more flexibility, so many more options when it comes to, to lighting. Moving lights have done that also. Excuse me. Also, it has helped us on tour um, because as you can imagine, uh, it takes a long time to focus static lighting units, a long, long time. And if you have moving lights, there's a procedure where you can zero them to particular places and you don't have to go through every single solitary cue to make sure that they're going to hit their marks. So it's really helped on tour to help us move faster, be more efficient and um, be able to reduce our focus time. Um, and it's also just cool. It's also just cool. Moving lights are really cool um, because they actually become like part of the show. And we, you see the lights now, you see the lighting and it's really, it's part of the action of the show and it can really, it really adds the ambiance of the show. So um, I love moving lights, they're very cool. And the consoles uh, have changed so much because of that. Um, you know, back when I was in college, uh, we had what was called a 10 scene preset board. And what that was, was like you had 50 dimmers and you had all these little slides that would dim each, each channel, which controlled a group of lights. And you had 10 of these. And like we had pieces of paper with all the levels and you'd have to like go and change everything by hand. So lighting designers were limited as to how many cues they could put in a show. And now they have computer consoles. You can have, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and there's no, virtually no limit to how many cues you can have in a show because you have a computer console that can ch change the, the cue very quickly. Whereas, you know, before we were doing things manually. So sometimes, and, and that was a 10 scene preset, there were also two scene presets. You could only set up two cues. And so you'd have to go back and forth between the two, the two presets. So you could do like, you know, you, you literally there were times you would have to say to the lighting designer, I can't, we can't set that cue up fast enough and they'd have to cut a cue. Nowadays, that just doesn't happen. A lighting designer can have cues just going like, you know, half a second, quarter of a second, right on each other. So I think when I first started calling, um, calling shows as a stage manager, there were maybe, you know, 200 cues in a show. Now there's, you know, 500, 600 show, uh, cues in a show. Um, LED technology has also changed a lot. Obviously power draw is huge. You know, incandescent light is such a huge power draw. Also makes things very hot. Now we have LED technology. Um, much less power draw and also lots of options for color, color mixing. 
you know, initially um, the LED light was very cold. I think we all had kind of a reaction to it of it, it being very cold, but LED now, the LED lighting has gotten so good that um, it's warmed up a lot. And we really, uh, many, many shows are shifting over to completely total LED, um, LED lighting. So uh, that's been a really exciting uh, technology. Um, in addition to lighting, then we have audio. Um, and audio, you know, it seems like it wouldn't be that big of a deal, <laughs> but the microphones and speakers, consoles, um, that's been um, that's been obviously something huge that's helped us. The wireless microphones, the body microphones that the actors can wear. Sometimes you see them there. Sometimes they're up here on their head or over their ear, kind of boomed like this. And um, that's been huge because the intimacy that we can create with that uh, and, and the sound quality we can create with that is just incredible. And the isolation, you know, so we can really, you know, sound designers can, can really isolate um, <clears throat> the orchestra better. They can control the orchestra. They can control the, the singers on stage. They can blend and mix um, to create a really pleasing uh, sound for us so that we can really hear all the lyrics and um, support the actors so that they're not losing their voices. Um, all of that's really, really important. Um, also, the consoles, again, much like with lighting, uh, consoles used to be uh, manual and, and the audio engineers would have to literally raise and lower you know, all the faders. Like when somebody walked on stage, the fader would have to go up. You know, when they walked off stage, it would have to go out. They're, they're mixing large ensembles all by hand. It was very, very hard. And there was a lot of opportunity for errors, even though our sound engineers are and were terrific. Um, and they would also have to like EQ each person individually with the pots on the console. Now, again, that's all digital, just like with lighting, all digital. They pre-program everything. Yes, they kind of mix live. There may be a night when things sound a little bit different and they may be tweaking things as they go, but all the cues are in the board. They just press the button and the cues, and actually they call them flying faders. Some of the boards have flying faders, which is kind of cool because the faders all move on their own. Um, and they press the button, it's all pre-programmed. So I think those are for me, and again, I'm not a super technical person, so I can't tell you about like, you know, how speakers have changed or how, you know, some of the other technology have cha has changed. But for me, what I see, microphones and consoles have been huge in our industry um, and have really brought us to a place. Again, a show like Hamilton, when you think of the rapid fire nature of that show, there's so many lyrics in that show and um, it, it would be so hard without those wireless body mics right there on their person, able to pick their voices up so that you can understand what they're saying. So um, very, very important. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so projections is the, is the last technical piece I wanna talk about. Um, Projections, front projection, which is the classic projection you think of. Um, and then you have LED walls and panels and curtains and LED tape. And basically that's, there's two pieces to this. There's the integration with the scenery and then there's the substituting for scenery. So we now have started to integrate LED panels and, um, and uh, curtain and tape into our scenery so we can light our scenery up make it appear different, change its color uh, by marrying, you know, fiberglass and, and LED technology. You can get some great effects. Frozen, as a matter of fact, Frozen, uh, the Disney musical uh, that I worked on that, into, that uses this particular type of technology where uh, things are, are lit up and can really change, um, change the appearance of the scenery. Uh, so that's been a really exciting development. Also LED wall, a back wall in theaters uh, and shows now we can use um, instead of creating a bunch of different uh, drops or scenic pieces that are at the back of the, of the scenery. Uh, so we can change it and it can change very, very easily and quickly. And we create lots of different looks with these LED walls at the back uh, of the stage. Uh, and then sometimes we substitute for scenery. Sometimes projections help us because Instead of building a piece of scenery, we can approximate it with projections and um, we can, you know, substitute rather than, uh, as I'm saying, building four different things, maybe one or two of those things become projections and um, 
we can make that look better or worse. Sometimes it doesn't work very well. Sometimes it works great. I think for Frozen, it worked actually really well for Elsa's Ice Palace. We created a lot of that with, with, uh, with projections on the LED wall and that ended up looking uh, really cool. Um, the other thing exciting about projections right now is that there is this ability to track. There's an ability to track um, projections on scenic pieces by using uh, wireless technology. So you can put a, a transmitter on a piece of scenery or on a human, uh, and you can actually, the projection or the moving light, quite frankly, can follow, can follow those things um, uh, by having a transmitter and receiver and sending that signal to the moving light or the projector so that you can actually follow it. And we, the projector can actually, by placing several um, transmitters, you can actually cut it to the actual piece of scenery. So, um, so that's, been very exciting uh, and that's really happened over the last kind of 20 years uh, i worked on a show that was had heavy projections and uh, it was called pony projectors um, and those were actually glass slides that were done by hand uh, and that was just back in like kind of the mid 90s so you know just in the last um, 25 years huge leaps uh, in projection that have had a, a, a really great effect i think in general been, been a hugely important for our industry um, so that's kind of the technology. Uh, I just want to mention, given where we are today, um, what's going on in the world is kind of the pandemic. I think that this is sort of the next thing, like, you know, what is the pandemic going to do um, in as regards theater storytelling uh, and technology? I think we've already seen it. We've seen a lot of people going online, doing Zooms, figuring out ways to do shows, um, you know, virtually. Uh, so uh, I think the pandemic is actually going to open up a whole new set of things. And I think we're going to see people do producing theater and performing and creating theater in, in very, very different ways after the pandemic. And I think in some ways that's, that's really cool and a good thing, obviously at a great cost that it's not worth it. But um, if that's one thing that comes out of this, um, there's kind of a, an opportunity to open our minds and think about new ways to do things. I think that's um, that's kind of cool. So I think I'm at the end of my spiel. Jake? Um, well, Mimi, I have so, I, first of all, the world that you're in and the access that you've had throughout your career is just astounding. So you know, I have a, a, a background in media and entertainment and a lot of you know, film and TV and also some time in the theater as well. So you and I will have fun talking offline about that. Um, at one point I was actually in a Kabuki play. Oh, which wow. Is definitely a very special kind of, of, of theater. Yes. Um, so, you know, in, while people are thinking about their questions, I'm gonna kick off some questions if you don't mind. Sure. Um, and then uh, everybody, of course, uh, in, in this group, uh, is lucky enough to be able to ask questions of you. So, so feel free to ask questions, uh, everybody. I'm going to start off by asking a question really about, you know, a lot of people when they think about the theater and, and you're talking about Broadway specifically. So the, the work that what you're doing now, so your background, of course, regional theater in certain locations that are out throughout the United States and other parts, right? And then you're talking about off-Broadway, Right, so the Broadway is that area that everybody knows, 42nd Street in that immediate area, right? That's the, the famous Broadway theater area, right? And then yeah. the off-Broadway and then off-off-Broadway that are close but not quite, the seating is smaller, right? So you've worked yep. in all of these um, fields. And the question that I, that I would have for you is, because I've worked on productions that have millions of dollars, and I've mm. worked on productions yeah. that have very little money. Like, <laughs> I've worked on a lot of productions where it's like, you know, hey, I know that actor and that director and this person has a camera and this person has a light. Let's go out and shoot a short film, right? So when I think about, you know, and when I, when I think about uh, Iron Man, for example, that, yeah. that to me is like Broadway. That's like Broadway mm -hmm. in the theater world, right? That's the the top Definitely. thing that's the multi-million dollar production so in your in your 30 plus years of experience what are some of the uh, most incredible 
uh, team experiences that you've had? Yeah. yeah, you know, I think first of all, being on being on tour, being on those on those one night or bus and truck tours. I mean, that's just there is nothing that will bond people faster than living on a bus and not showering for a few days. There is absolutely nothing that will bond people faster than that. It is so hard, and you have to be young. I think, uh, and you just have this um, this mentality of, of everybody kind of being in it together and really pulling together um, because the, the more you help each other, the better day you're all going to have because there are bad, bad, bad days on those kinds of tours. There are very bad days. There are literally days where we walked into a high school and the high school kid, like I, and I'm not kidding when I say this, we were walking to a high school one day and the Fox Theater in Atlanta the next day. And I don't know if anybody's ever been to the Fox. The Fox is a humongous 5,000 seat theater in Atlanta, gorgeous. So, you know, but we literally might've been in a high school the day before. So, you know, you walk into the high school and it's high school kids helping you load in and they're here for an hour and then they leave and then somebody else comes in and then they leave and all day you're like, you know, just crazy. And then you do the show and then the show comes down and you look around and you're like, where are the kids to help us load out? And then the teacher's like, oh, well, they had to go home. They have school tomorrow. <laughs> and you're like, wait, but we have to take this show out now because we have to go to another city. So like when you have days like that, you know, um, that bonds you so quickly. So I think that's that's one thing. I think that um, working at Paper Mill, we had, a, we had a financial crisis at Paper Mill when I was there and that really bonded all of us there at paper mill. We really all pulled together and we, we saved literally saved the theater from closing that was, and now it's extraordinarily successful. So that was a hugely bonding moment. And then newsies, you know, work. I was so lucky to work on newsies. I don't know how many of you're familiar with newsies, but if you haven't seen it, there's a film called newsies, the Broadway musical available on Disney plus, and you should check it out because I worked on it and it's really cool. Um, that was there was something about that show everyone who worked on it everyone who ever touched it loved that show and it was always a great experience and um that it was just and i can't even tell you exactly what what it was but something about that show really um really bonded us all the creatives the cast the staff we all had a great time working on that show so that was a lot of fun and that was so cool because we actually so that was a tour that we then filmed and made into a movie um, and, uh, that was a very cool experience, um, because we were literally capturing a live, we were ca capturing a stage show. And so it had to be kind of a little like a film and then a little like a Broadway show. So that was really fascinating to work on that. Oh, that, that's wonderful. I put the name Newsies in the chat box. So if everybody's interested, that, that's, that's the play that you're talking about. That was yeah. really, uh, uh, you know, some complications, but really the team came together and built it out. Um, I think the efficiency in teams and, and the kindness of other people working together really goes a long way. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions to people in the audience. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions. I have so many questions, but I want this to be your time with Mimi. So feel, feel free to unmute and ask questions. Hi, Mimi. Uh, my name is Ken Xinyan, and I'm actually a costume designer. And awesome. since spring 2020, the pandemic happened, I have only got a few illustration jobs and one online production, and it's not really custom heavy. So that's when I turned back to school for digital, uh, digital art study. So what I wanted to ask is how, uh, how do you think the COVID situation gonna affect live theater, um, not only now and in the future. Yeah, so I think um, in addition to some new thinking about how how we communicate with theater goers and how we present our, our shows, I don't think Broadway is gonna change a lot to be honest with you. It's, as I say, theater is an old stodgy industry and Broadway is the oldest, oldest and stodgiest of all of them. So. I don't know that you'll see a lot of change with Broadway. I hope that Broadway will change in terms of kind of some of the marketing and using, using better um, some other platforms for that. But I think you're going to see a big change in the regions. And I think actually we're going to see a shift to the regions um, over the next few years. Broadway is going to have a hard time coming back fully until tourists are back. 
and people are sort of saying it's going to probably take until about 2025 until we really see the tourist levels of tourism that we'd seen pre-pandemic in New York. So Broadway is going to be slow to come back. But I think the regional theaters are going to come back pretty, pretty quickly because that's your neighborhood theater, right? That's the theater down the way. And so people don't have to go anywhere. Um, so I think that the regions are going to come back faster. And I also think the regions have really learned a lesson in this. And I hope that they take this opportunity to figure out some new ways um, to offer their, their content to people. You know, because theater is expensive. And I can see a place where in the future, you know, a regional theater might decide that, you know, if you want to come and be an in-person subscriber, then you, yes, you know, it's five shows and you're going to pay X amount of money, but maybe you get some sort of a membership and if you don't have to be a subscriber, but maybe you get a membership and, and you get access to three of those shows online, you know, after they have their live run in the theater, um, or there's a completely online um, part of their season. And people can just, you know, there's there's particular shows for the online subscribers. Um, and then there's a set of shows for the people, you know, for the people who are in the theater. So I think that's that's where I think we're going to see a change. I think we're going to see a change in the regions. And I think I think the excitement's actually going to shift out to the regions here for a little bit, which is great. I think that's really because that's where you can do the exciting stuff. You know, Broadway, you got to make money in the regions it's not for profit. So you can take a little more risk. You can be a little more risky and a little more um, cutting edge. And so that's what I, I hope that's what comes out of it. I, I hope that's where we get after the pandemic. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question and a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, any, any other questions? I, I know people have been DM or not DMing me, but putting this in the chat box. Uh, so feel free to feel feel free to ask. Don't just ask me yeah. privately. Go ahead and ask. Yeah, I had a question actually. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was thinking, kind of playing into this, but like the emergence of like immersive theater experiences, like Sleep No More, and like and then she fell and all of that. Do you see like traditional Broadway kind of shifting into that, or that as a competitor, or do you think they're definitely going to be separate with VR and everything else coming in technology play too? I mean, I feel like those before immersive you answer that, oh, sure. Yeah, before you answer that, can you kind of explain the difference for some of the people who might not know who were here? Sure. So um, Sleep No More is basically, uh, when we say immersive, you're not sitting traditionally in a traditional theater where you're sitting in a seat and you're watching the show happen. Sleep No More is basically Macbeth, um, but it, it takes place in a multi-room venue where you move in the rooms and you move between the scenes. and and you experience the show, not uh, sometimes non-linear non in a non-linear fashion, but you move and, and the various scenes are taking place in various rooms. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I think that's a non-starter for Broadway only because um, of the, I mean, you'll, you'll hear a lot right now what people are talking about is that financially Broadway can't come back with limited capacity. Uh, and that's because basically our weekly operating expenses are, are very high. So, um, you know, it costs, let's say, to run a Broadway show, it costs $950,000 a week. So in order to make that and then make some profit, we have to be at 60 or 70% capacity at, at minimum. Um, so that's the kind of financial piece, you know, and that's why you'll hear people, you'll hear a lot of press saying that Broadway can't come back at limited capacity. By the same token, in order to have a kind of immersive experience, I just, I don't know how you fit a thousand or 1200 people into that immersive experience. I think it could be done. I don't, I don't know if you could make money at it is the problem. Um, so I don't, I don't think that happens on Broadway. Um, but I do think the VR thing is interesting. And I, I've been wondering a lot about like, you know, could you have a show where, you know, you you put the VR on for certain, you enhance like it, it's enhancements, right? So you still have the show happening in front of you, but you have, you know, you have like a, like a Google Glass on or something like that. And at various times, content is pushed to the Google Glass to enhance the experience of the Broadway show, you know, by adding things into that that you couldn't do on the stage that even with all of our technology we we could not do so i think there is that possibility 
Um, I think it has to get to a place where it would be kind of effortless though, where you'd have to have like the glasses on and not even be thinking about it. Cause if you're putting things on and taking things off, it takes you out of the moment. In theater, you want to be drawn in and, and stay in. Um, we're actually, you know, we've been talking about this with closed captioning too, because, um, or op actually open captioning, I guess, but, you know, trying to use Google Glass or something like that, something similar to try and give folks um, who need um, subtitles, um, whether they have a, a, a hearing situation or, or a language situation, uh, trying to get something where they can experience those show fully without having to look down all the time, you know, and so we're trying, I think there's a lot of technology coming along that hopefully will be useful for that. And I think we could see that then tra transition at some point into like a VR additive thing, like you're saying. Uh, with, with that, Mimi, in terms of technology, you've talked about projection, you know, being able to project in certain types of lighting and other things like that. When you have a ability for like a digital screen or something like that to be able to deal with visual effects and other things that are going, um, because, you know, I've been to some pretty high level productions where you'll have water and smoke and fire and all sorts of things going on, but you also have the element of maybe rather than something physically on somebody, but maybe screens and layerings of the theater and the stage. What is some of that that's being discussed or being used? Um, I think, uh, you know, like I said, with Frozen, we're doing that a lot. I mean, we have the LED that's in the scenery that, that changes the look of the scenery completely. Um, and then we have that, we have an LED wall upstage where we can change that content so easily, um, seamlessly. Um, and then I mean, there are some, you know, some shows that are using, um, you know, like literally LED panels for, you know, for legs, you know, which are the, the framing pieces. Um, so I think that you're going to start seeing, yes, you're exactly right, a layering of all of this stuff. You know, you're going to see LED in the in, in, integrated into the scenery integrated with screens you know we can project on scrim and and drops uh and i think uh as i was mentioning there's this technology now where you can follow you can track and that's and that's huge you can track like people walking along the floor um you can you can track scenic pieces with projection and light with this, these RF, uh, I don't know if they're RF, I shouldn't say that, with these trans, transmitters, I think they work like wireless microphones. Um, so, you know, you can transmit a signal and you can literally follow and change what's on a scenic piece, you know, so at, from moment to moment. So, yeah, I think you're going to start seeing a layering of all of those things. Uh, I think Frozen is probably the closest thing right now to doing that but i'm sure you're going to see more and more of it as we go and as this tracking technology starts to happen we're going to be able to track people with lights and projection uh it can be used i mean it's already that's already being used actually in in the disney parks um and uh you can you can also use it for sound so that when somebody walks off stage their microphone automatically goes off when they walk on stage it goes on um but anyway that that tracking of the visual, you know, effects, um, I think is going to start being added in as that technology evolves. I hope that answered, thank answered your question. Yeah, that, thank you so much. Now it's it, the insight in the background you have is something that, you know, we really don't have access to. That's why we're so lucky to have you here. Uh, what, uh, any other questions? Um, I had a question. Hi, sure. me, uh, Rudeja here. Hi. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, if musical uh, Broadway shows have a very similar technical uh, background that you're talking about, or does it depend from um, like show to show? Like, is it different? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, yes, it is it is different. Um, you know, a show, I mean, ironically, a show like Hamilton 
it's not a, and I don't know if you all are familiar with that show. That's that's the like the big hit show the last few years, Lin Manuel Miranda, the rap musical about Alexander Hamilton. That's actually a really pretty straightforward show. There's a turntable, so in the deck, which is the the stage floor, there's there's a there's a big circle that that rotates. And in fact, I think it might be, it might be two. I think there's a middle one, and they can rotate two, you know, like that. Um, it's actually a pretty straightforward show, though. I mean, take a, you know the turntable, and it's it's really incredible lighting, but it's not a super high tech show. Um, Frozen, lots of technology, tons of technology. Um, so yeah, it really varies from show to show, and I think it has to do with how you serve the story. So I think Frozen is a show that begged big technology. A show like Hamilton, it just isn't necessary, and in fact could could take away. There are shows, there, there are definitely shows um, that um, have been eclipsed by their technology. Um, Titanic is a show that comes to mind. So there was a musical about Titanic, about the Titanic, if, if you can believe that. And that was, I wanna say it was prior to the movie. It was not the movie, it was completely separate. Um, but it had all of this hydraulics with, you know, the, sh the ship the doing this and people falling and things moving. And actually that show is really great. The score to that show is beautiful, but it kind of got overwhelmed by the technology and it wasn't maybe the best way to tell that story. And so I think um, that the important thing is not to make it as technologically cool as you can, it's about serving the story. And if, if you think too much about the technology and you focus too much on that, you can lose your story. So it has to all be in service to the story. Because the reason we go see theater is we go see theater for the story. I mean, that's why, right? And, and to see people live on stage and to have a, 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 an experience, which we're all, I think, desperate for right now, a human to human, you know, sitting in the same theater with everyone laughing and clapping and crying together you know we're, we're desperate for that right now um but that's we go see for the story and for the characters and so the technology has to be in service of that and so i think um it's important when you're putting together a broadway show to to make sure that you don't just say well let's add all the technology we can and of course every broadway show has a different economic model and you know some producers want to spend more or less you know, with Disney, um, we're different because we're a corporation and we get money from the studio. We don't have investors uh, like um, like other shows. Uh, so we don't have to worry about the investors. Obviously, we want to make money and do well for the studio. Um, but it also depends on the economic situation of that particular show. But in general, I think what you see is technology in service of storytelling. That's the that's the important piece of it. Um, just running down the, you know, running crazy with technology is not going to serve if your story is not good and your music isn't isn't good. Well, thank you so much. Any other questions? That was a great question. It's it's always it's a question in any type of production, I think, right, Mimi? Absolutely. In terms of you know what what level do you need? And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I always talk in classes about the importance of story. And, and you, you talked about technology, you talked about the old school style of theater, right? But how, in terms of your experience, how does story play into success of the theatrical productions that you've been part of? I mean, it's the most, it's the most important thing. I, 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 you cannot, I mean, between, the music is also very important. If you have a great story, but the music is terrible, <laughs> that's not so good. Um, but I think that the story is, is key. You know, you have to um, craft a story that people can work their way into. You know, they have to be able to get into the story. I think it's, you know, um, I think it's one of the things that was so su successful about Newsies. It's just a really cool story. It's it's about kids. It's about these newspaper, these newsboys and newsgirls. Um, you know, at the turn of the, the century, the 19th to the 20th century, 
selling papers and being taken advantage of by these huge corporations. And it's a story about how the kids fight back. That's a great story. You know, Lion King. I mean, Lion King is a great story. And that's a perfect example of a show that's, yes, it's technical, but it's also very artisanal, right? So those, those masks and, and the puppets, they're all handcrafted and handmade. And they're based on very old storytelling um, models that, you know, Julie Taymor, the director, um, studied in, in Asia. And I, forgive me, I don't, I don't remember the country, but, um, you know, she studied um, masks and puppets and, and that the use of those things in storytelling. Um, and, um, you know, that's a, that's a, those things aren't really highly technical in, in the way that you would normally think of it. But that story, if it, it supported that story, and the story is such a great story. I mean, it's essentially Hamlet, right? It's basically Hamlet, um, because we all keep telling the same stories over and over again, right? That's why I love it when people say, oh, this show is this show or that show or this movie or that movie is so derivative. I'm like, listen, we've been telling the same five stories for the last 5,000 years. So just get over it with the derivative. Like, it's everything's derivative. So um, I think story is, is hugely important and uh, you can put all the bells and whistles on things you want to, but if it's not a story people can work their way into and identify with and sympathize with the characters, it's all for naught. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Does, does anybody have any other questions? I, I know Mimi is giving up for Saturday night to be with us, and we appreciate that greatly. Uh, does anybody have any any last question? I just have a quick question, and it's really interesting uh, where she works and everything. But I was wondering, is it uh, any way that, like, if you're a major on business analytics, can you work in that industry? So. Um, the theatrical industry is, is pretty, um, it's pretty small and it's pretty basic. Um, I would say it could be challenging, but what I will say is that, um, with, for someone with a, kind of a math brain, what there is certainly is, um, the opportunity to, uh, work. They do a lot of work now on demand-based pricing. Do you all know what demand-based pricing is? Um, we know how when you go to look for a, you go to look for a, um, a, uh, an airplane ticket and you look one day and it's $200 and you look the next day, literally the next day and it's $500. And that's because the plane went from being, you know, 25% full to 40% full. Um, and th that's all based on algorithms. And we do the same thing in theater. This is done in, on Broadway. It's done in touring houses. It's done in regional theaters and it's an algorithm. And somebody has to write those algorithm, algorithms and, and, and research those, those <laughs> do those analytics. So um, depending on what business analytics looks like, there's absolutely analytics in theater for sure. Um, you know, and that's on the ticket and selling side. It's on some of the data side, collecting data and, for, and information about subscribers and, and ticket buyers and theater goers. Um, so yeah, there's definitely analytics in, in theater, uh, exactly how you get to that. I can't personally tell you, um, because that's not anywhere part of my job, but, um, but yeah, I believe there are analytics in theater. And I think you would just have to figure out, um, how to connect the dots, uh, to get to a position like that. Thank yeah. you so much. And, that I say, and I would say that, uh, you know, in that, in terms of film finance, the same thing goes for Broadway finance. Right. So if you have a business mind and a mathematical mind, there's a lot of finance that goes into theater, plus the analytics and looking at some of the actors. Right. Just like when you're looking at um, movies, right, certain certain talent tracks and does better, I'm sure, as well. And maybe theater. Yeah, I mean, and certainly yeah, like oh, sorry, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, no, no, I, that's what I was kind of asking. So yes, please, please go ahead, Mimi. Yeah, certainly Disney, you know, in other other divisions of Disney, there's tons of business analytics. So DisneyCareers.com, it's a website. We post every job uh, that is available across the company on DisneyCareers.com. 
And yeah, there's tons of opportunity, I would imagine, in film and television for, for that kind of analytics, for sure. Yeah. And if you end up loving it and figure out that you're a big finance person, you can go to Broadway and people will love you because you'll finance a lot of plays. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll, be everyone, you'll be everyone's best friend. I know a lot of theater people who are, who are big financiers who are now producing a lot of feature films and doing other things because they love theater, but right now they can't invest. And so they're investing in film and TV right. projects. So I think there's yeah. a wide, wide opening for a lot of you, buddy. I mean, a lot of you are, you know, electrical engineering, there's opportunity in terms of robotics and other things. There's, there's a lot in, in, in anything that Mimi's talking about. You know, she had that slide of, uh, you know, those slides of technology. There's so much technology going on. Um, but then at the core, you know, you have that story. Mimi, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you've been doing this for, for 30, 30 plus years. Um, it seems like you're so happy. <laughs> did, did, you made the right choice. You made the right choice. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, in in college it was so hard because I was so upset that I it kind of evident that I wasn't going to be an actor, and now I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, I I've, I've gotten to do so many cool things, and um, you know, I wouldn't change it for anything. And I do want to say, Jake, that for sure, you know, your students here, I mean. There, there is a lot in, there's a lot in theater happening on a, I mean, theater's a small industry. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to um, be uh, too rosy about theater because it is a small industry as opposed to like film and television, which is huge. But in theater, there exists, you know, people who do all of the front end programming, you know, bes there are bespoke automation programs that are written at scenic shops. There's, you know, programming that's written for lighting and lighting consoles, sound consoles, you know, there's, I, I do think robotics is in our future. I don't know how far in our future, but we'll get there. We'll be the last ones. Everybody else will also do it first, but we'll get there. Um, you know, in the parks, the Disney parks, robotics, you know, um, definitely there. Uh, lots of programming that goes into stuff at the Disney parks, the rides and all of that. So there's, there's a ton of stuff in the entertainment industry, obviously, whether it be television, film, resorts and parks, theater, um, that's supported by, you know, tech, technology of the type that a lot of your students are studying, I'm sure. I think we had one more person who was trying to speak earlier. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Or maybe their audio is just on. <laughs> Does anybody have any, any final question here? All right. Well, Mimi, we thank you so much for being here today. Uh, it's, it's been a tremendous honor to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one thank thing you. I'd like to do is, take a, is to take a photo with you, with everybody. So everybody turn turn on your cameras and we're going to take a a photo here with Mimi. So let me see here. Uh, there we go. All right. And um, everybody smile. And uh, three, two, and all right. That's great. We'll take one more picture just that way we have an option. Here we go. All right. And we'll do it again. One, two, and three. Okay, great. So Mimi, I just want to say again, from everybody here, thank you very much. We know that you could spend your Saturday night doing many other things. Um, we're honored to hear from you here. Uh, your access to industry is impressive. The work that you've done is impressive and your words are very thoughtful and encouraging. So thank you very much. Um, I guess without further ado, um, I guess we'll say good night to you. Thank you. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you all for being uh, uh, such a great uh, a room and great audience. So thank you and take care. <laughs>